every asset should be digital and it should be a coin family on Ava. These coins themselves can pick and choose from a variety of scripting languages we support. There isn't a single scripting language. And most importantly, you can actually define the set of nodes that host your state. interest and excitement there is in anyone's space is to see what, what sort of people are doing in their off time, if you will. And if you go to YouTube and you look at how many songs there are about Facebook, about Google, or about free software, and you combine them all, that number is far fewer than the number of songs written about cryptocurrencies. So there's something going on here. There's something real going on. People are really excited by this. But what's going on? Like, what's happening? Well, uh, if we fast forward a little bit, we see now that there are about 2,000 cryptocurrencies, where there's lots and lots of competing projects. And all of these projects are trying to copy each other. There is sort of implicit convergence. Every one of them starts to look the same. Every speaker begins to sound the same. I will say things today and I find myself repeating phrases that Justin's son also says. And this pains me immensely. So, um, so we've got these undifferentiated products, and, um, and many of them have failed for, for predictable reasons. What I want to do today is share with you my little vision, and share with you what we're building, and maybe tell you a little bit about the academic background that goes behind cryptocurrencies, and sort of set you up intellectually for this like, framework of, uh, of how I can lead you uh, cryptocurrencies. Now, of course, I should mention, the dream is really compelling. Right? The dream that Satoshi introduced to us, which is a, one of disintermediation, of getting rid of the people who have positioned themselves at bridgeheads, at sort of uh, particular financial moats, and they collect rent from you every time you want to do something. You want to own a stock? Welcome to Charles Schwab. You want to trade? Welcome to NASDAQ and NYSE. You want to trade that thing? You can't, okay, for whatever reason. There's regulation up the wazoo. So that is something that's really interesting. Uh, the fact that we can actually get rid of this, uh, these intermediaries and take finance into our own hands. So it's a huge opportunity for many, and it's an extinction level event for many incumbents. So that's all great, but it's my contention, and I think those of you who are here are probably here because you're dissatisfied with what you have in your hands. It's my contention that the current technology cannot deliver that dream to us. As compelling as the dream is, we can't get there with the technology we have today. Three big hurdles are ahead of us. One of them is one you know very well, it's scale. None of these technologies scale. Bitcoin executes at five transactions per second. IKEA clears more than that on a Saturday. Okay, so you're not going to replace the US dollar with something that actually executes about, you know, barely IKEA. If Venezuela switched to Bitcoin, every adult gets to, uh, gets to create I guess you create one transaction once a month. So by the time they all open up channels, or some of you are going to jump up and down and say, oh no, what about the Lightning Network? I'm going to push aside all of the privacy concerns about the Lightning Network. Even opening channels for those people will take many months. Okay, so um, uh, the second problem, of course, is usability. All of these networks provide the same lowest common denominator service, and I'll talk about that later on. And of course, governance. None of these things are governable. That you just sort of throw them over the fence, they sit there, and everything you ever encoded in them is, is, has to remain true for the next set of decades to come. And no one can do economic planning nine months ahead, let alone nine years ahead, let alone 90 years ahead. So it's preposterous to think that you could actually fix something statically and, and hope to keep people happy. So, uh, let's see, I'm not going to spend too much time, but uh, you all know that the existing systems that we have that are based on mining uh, have a lot of problems. They have long confirmation times. You want security, you have to wait. How long? Well, for Bitcoin, it's 60 minutes. That's a long time. Okay? Um, they have low throughput, and, uh, and they have inherent centralization. Look at mining. Only a few people manufacture the rigs. Only a few people have access to cheap electricity. And if you look at what's happening, they converge. These like mining pools are very small in number. There are 19 of them for all of Bitcoin. Okay. That's it. I know how to actually govern something with 19 people, and I don't have to use any mining at all. There are many other protocols that will do the job. 
So it's crazy to be actually um, spending that much energy for something so centralized. And, uh, and of course, uh, what we're seeing now, especially this year, is a series of projects that are trying to go back into academic work, trying to resurrect uh, old protocols to bring proof of stake back to life. And that's an interesting thing, and I understand the reasons why they want to do it. Uh, but all of the protocols they're trying to resurrect are both fragile and unable to scale themselves to more than a few hundred validators. So, let me try to put everything in perspective. So, here's sort of a, the last 45 years of distributed systems, my field. Uh, it's been around for only 45 years. And in that time frame, there were only two big consensus protocol families. Uh, my colleagues Leslie Lamport and Barbara Lisko started the entire academic uh, line of work on consensus protocols. And there have been many, 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 many uh, protocols that have been devised within that framework. Satoshi came in 2009, he looked at these and he said, look, you academics, you've been doing something, but it's completely irrelevant to me. Because your assumption, your framework, assumes that everybody agrees who the uh, validators are. And I can't do that, I want something open. And I want something more robust than uh, something that requires all of us to agree on who the validators are. And so he came up with the Nakamoto Consensus Protocol. So we had the last 10 years based on that, that uh, discovery, that brilliant insight. Something interesting happened about, about a year ago. The Avalanche Protocol was dropped by a team that calls itself Team Rocket. And Avalanche combines the best of both worlds. It's robust, like Nakamoto Consensus, but it's also efficient and high performance like classical consensus. It achieves very, very, very low latency. So the finality in Avalanche is about a second or so. It achieves very high throughput. It's lightweight. When there is no work to do, Avalanche just sits there and doesn't consume any energy whatsoever. And there is no mining at all. So there is no electricity going into uh, maintaining this. And it has some other interesting, uh, somewhat quirky features. One of them is that it can withstand larger than 51% adversaries if you configure it to do so. And it's also highly scalable. It scales like no other. It scales much better than both, uh, both Nakamoto and Classical. So let me tell you a little bit about this. I'm not going to tell you how it works because uh, it takes a little bit of time. I don't think I have that much time. Um, but the, the ultimate outcome of this thing is this essentially works in by polling the audience repeatedly and throwing your weight behind what you think is the winning idea. And uh, it turns out that this converges very fast to a decision. And uh, the, all of the, the gory math is in the, the, the Avalanche paper. Uh, but just to give you a sort of a sense of uh, how fast this thing is, in classical protocols, every node has to talk to every other. So if you try to run it with, let's say, a thousand validators, you have a thousand squared messages, and uh, it's a million, that's a lot of messages. You want to do 10,000, well then it just starts bl uh, blowing up because of n squared, and uh, it won't be able to scale. In the Avalanche family, every node talks to only a small subset of other nodes. Okay? And that allows this thing to be very, very efficient. I'm going to show you performance numbers, I want you to understand why it is that it's different. And um, if you were to try to achieve consensus in a group of 10,000 with Avalanche, it would require only about 85 messages per node, as opposed to 10,000. So um, the latency of this operation is incredibly, incredibly low. So it achieves finality in about a second. And this compares very well uh, to other approaches to the same problem, like Algorand, which requires about 50. Uh, like Ethereum, which requires about 518, or a Bitcoin, which requires about an hour. And the throughput is very high. I want to show you this particular graph. Let's see. So this is um, this is a uh, this is a recorded session from our testnet. So if you watch what's going on, this is our testnet. That's our little DAG explorer at the top. Those are the avalanche uh, transactions taking shape. We are achieving about seven transactions per second. Eight. And, uh, you know, we start injecting them faster and faster. Nine. At some point, the front end will become unable to show the number of transactions per second. That's about 10, 11, yeah, 12. We're going up a little bit. And, uh, and I think you can see the y-axis is also automatically adjusting. 15. Yeah, okay, that's fast. That's like Ethereum fast. Now it's faster than that. Now it's 30. 
And uh, that's 36, it's going up there. Um, I think at around, uh, around 100 we're going to cut it off and not show you the DAG because it's very hard to show. Yeah, but you can see the graph. Yep, 3,000, 4,000, 6,800 or so is where it peaked. It should slow down a tiny bit to about 5,000 something. So this is a real thing, and uh, people were always, wanted, were always saying, oh, you can't compete with Visa. You know, they do 5,000 transactions per second. You can't possibly do that outside of a data center, blah, blah, blah. 5,000 TPS is not a very high number. We just did it. This is a geographically distributed test. Set. All right. Um, normally, uh, there are lots of, lots of tricks, of course, to like, sort of lie with numbers. Um, and one of the main tricks is, of course, you show a huge number, but in the background, you're trading off security for performance. Well, that's not what we do in Avalanche. We actually have much stronger immutability than Bitcoin itself. So, uh, and in fact, we also have much stronger decentralization. As I mentioned, Bitcoin has 19, valid, uh, 19 mining pools. Ethereum has 11. EOS, which you know, a lot of people make fun of for its cabal formation and centralization, has 21 validators. These are tiny numbers, uh, whereas Avalanche can scale from 10,000 to millions of nodes. The benchmark I just showed you on this previous slide had uh, 2,000 nodes in it. And uh, the, um, one of the nice features of this protocol is um, that the Byzantine fault tolerance is configurable, and the lower you think the Byzantine component is, the more efficient the protocol becomes. And vice versa, um, these classical protocols have this funny property where they're, they're geared for a particular attacker size. And if the attacker is bigger than what you, what you sort of uh, lined up to, to withstand, then he wins. And typically that size is 33%. So if, uh, if the attacker is 34%, he owns your coin that very moment. In Avalanche, this is not so. You set up your system for a particular Byzantine component, and if the attacker is bigger than that, well, what happens is uh, he has more of a chance of winning and causing a double spend, but it's by no means guaranteed. So for example, if you, you geared up your system so that at 33%, the chance of a double spend is about once every 20,000 years, and the attacker turns out to be 40%, then he doesn't immediately succeed. In, in, instead, what happens is uh, he's more likely to succeed, not 20,000 years, but maybe once every 5,000 years. That's a very interesting and very robust way to handle attackers. Um, the other thing that I want to mention to you that's very key to the av avalanche or the AVA approach to, to life is this big difference uh, between, uh, uh, between us and every other coin. For every other coin, there is, they have the same exact vision for the network. They have one coin, they have one scripting language, and they have one network. You buy the coin, you go out and shill it, right? and you try to, to slightly modify the scripting language to adopt to new use cases. And when you do so, you get pushback from the people in the network saying, don't change anything. Right? You want to add something to Bitcoin? Well, you're going to have to go fight it out with Luke Jr. Right? Luke Jr. is going to tell you he's got nodes, you know, raspberry pies in the floor of the swamp, and he doesn't want you to change anything whatsoever. It's not, it's not meant to be changed. That is not the vision in AVA. We're the only coin where we have this other uh, approach, where we have the AVA coin, but we also envision having thousands of other coins. Every digital, every asset should be digital, and it should be a coin family on AVA. These coins themselves can pick and choose from a variety of scripting languages we support. There isn't a single scripting language. And most importantly, you can actually define the set of nodes that host your state. So you can say something like, hey, I'm going to introduce an X coin, this X coin is going to represent real estate. It has special rules where you can merge it when it's adjacent, etc. And uh, I like to use the Bitcoin scripting language. I'm familiar with it. I also like zero knowledge proofs from Zcash. I also like ring signatures from Monero. You could do this mix and match thing with, uh, with other coins. And on top of that, you get to say, by the way, my coin is not supported on a bunch of lowest common denominator volunteer provided nodes but it's supported on purple nodes. Now, who are purple nodes? You get to define who is purple. You get to uh, nominate and, and provide certificates to people who are purple. 
So what that means is you now have the ability to say, hey, if you want to be hosting my real estate coin, you should come to me, we should arrange a transaction where you promise to hold my data for the next 50 years. It's real estate information. And by the way, you will get transaction fees commensurate with the service you're providing. This, these are not opaque tokens to you. You know what you're doing. You can provide differentiated services on top of Ava and collect, uh, uh, collect uh, transaction fees accordingly. So, uh, as I said, it's a, it's a platform of platforms. It's a construction kit for digital assets. We are not competing with any of the existing coins. Our goal is not to carve off, you know, whatever, $5 from the price of BTC or whatnot. We don't care at all. They can do whatever they want, which is mostly blocking people and, and uh, <laughs> engaging in brigades online. Uh, but instead, uh, what we want to do is digitize those assets that are not currently in, in digital form. And, uh, one last thing I want to say in the last few moments I have here is the governance story. So I told you about the, uh, the, the one big breakthrough, which was the consensus protocol. I told you about the second big sort of change or difference between Ava and everybody else, which was this different view of the network, the platform of platforms. The third big difference has to do with governance. Everybody else is in the business, sadly, of having to fix everything at, at, uh, at on day, day zero. So Satoshi, for example, fixed the emissions curve for all time to come. Zcash inherited it, Ethereum inherited it. Now that curve is okay. Sometimes it's great, it matches demand and the price is stable. Sometimes it, it mints less than, there is a, than the, the, the demand, and so the price goes up and maybe that's okay. Um, but other times, in fact for extended periods of time, it mints too much, and then the price crashes. And uh, you can see this very well in Zcash and at times in Ethereum as well. They're minting far more than they should. So uh, in uh, Ava, the way the system works is, uh, the way the protocol works is by polling the audience. Okay? And so it's, it's that exact same mechanism that we use for governance decisions as well. So for example, any user in Ava can go online and say, hey guys, I noticed, I'm just a random user, but I noticed that we are, um, we're minting too much. Let's decrease the mint, minting rate. Or vice versa, we don't have enough nodes, let's increase the minting rate. And if there is social consensus, if there is people, sufficient people who accept this, then the system will adopt that proposal and move to a new point of operation. So we're not fixing everything for the next umpteen years to come. In fact, we're fixing almost nothing other than what happens on day zero. And on day one, things can change drastically, based on uh, that. Well, okay, sorry, I should also mention, things cannot change drastically, there are limits. We want to build calm and calming technology, uh, so it's, it can change within uh, certain bounds. So, uh, okay, so what, where does that take us? Well, the internet was introduced in 1962. It underwent many, 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 many different iterations. Just like the Wright brothers introduced their plane, and it underwent lots and lots of iterations. Almost, yeah, I would say, at least half of you, maybe 80% of you took an airplane here. There is very little in common with that airplane and the Wright brothers' original flyer. Okay? And crypto is no different. Uh, yes, we're, we have an amazing revolution to come ahead of us, and no, the existing technologies really cannot get us there, no matter what kind of lipstick you, you put on them. Uh, what we are trying to do with AVA is uh, innovate at all levels, starting from the consensus protocol, also with the network model, and also with, uh, with governance. And I haven't actually mentioned usability much, but we also have uh, announcements to come on in, you know, in terms of how this thing will be made usable for the masses. Um, so, I'm very excited about the financial revolution to come, and uh, if you want to get involved in AVA, um, I'm going to just flash my contact information, come and find me. I would love to work with people who are building exciting things on top. Thank you.